Greetings, brothers and sisters. Um, I got a bunch of stuff to get to, some weird um, or just incompetent public speaking by Kamala and Jojo Magoo, which is always funny, and a bunch of stuff to celebrity stuff to get to first. And then, of course, the economy's collapsing. <laughs> Touch on that a little bit. But um, I was watching the game between the Milwaukee Bucks and the Boston Celtics. It's being played in the Boston Garden, right, where the the uh, Boston Celtics fans were all gathered together. And I've noticed this for quite some time. It's been on my mind uh, to talk about it. But the fans of the Boston Celtics were screaming at the officials. Now, this is a behavior that's been around for a number of years, right? As long as I can remember, uh, fans have been screaming at the referees and all the sports, you know, every sport. This happens. It's part of the experience, right? The entitlement of the fans as well as the players. But it's gotten much worse. At least, you know, I'm noticing it a lot more. And the players particularly. And the NBA more than any other sport because there are so many plays. There's so much more action in an NBA game. And the fans are very present because of the proximity of the, you know, the fans to the game because they're so close to the court. And the TV, uh, the cameramen are always doing uh, shots of the fans, right? Like a group of fans, individual fans, as opposed to like the collective fans you see at like football games and things where there's less shots of the fans reacting. You know, once in a while there'll be a, a play, a controversial play. But almost every play, you see that the fans are like booing when they don't get a call. Like this team, don't, the teams don't get a call. And then they play the, you know, the replay, right? Sometimes replay supports the referees, right? Supports the officials' calls, but the fans still boo anyway, right? And the players still like whine and, you know. But almost after every play now, you see a player running up to the officials. And, you know, and, and the NBA now has adopted this soccer-like um, pretending you get hurt on every play. Anything that's um, a shot to the head area. You know, an elbow to the head or something. Even if it's just a graze, they go down, they hold their heads to make sure the officials go and review the play to see if there's some sort of malicious act so they can call a, a flagrant one or two. I mean, I've talked about this on my other channel a lot. But my point here is that does every team, does every fan of every team think there's some sort of conspiracy against their team? Because <laughs> that's what it appears, it appears to be. And every player thinks there's some personal conspiracy by the refs against them, right? Because they complain like constantly like they're being cheated and it's somehow unfair. Now, I want to get into the fans part. Uh, that's because that's the more important part of this segment. But for the players, they're making millions upon millions of dollars, right? I mean, some of them are making like hundreds of thousands of dollars just for th that game. And some of them are like superstars, you know, global, international superstars that are the beneficiaries of favorable officiating because they're not going to take a superstar out of the game, especially in a playoff game. And so they, you know, they give them favorable calls unless it's, you know, rigged somehow against them, which of course happens, right? But, you know, not every game, right? Not every game. I mean, these guys the players are acting like life is somehow cheating them, right? <laughs> They're getting paid to play a sport. You know, you know, there's work, whatever it is. It's an entertainment league. They're getting paid millions of dollars. And on a play-by-play -play, play, uh, basis, they're basically saying that they're some sort of a victim and it's unfair, right? Life is unfair to them personally. You know, not the other team, but them. Always them, you know, whatever. I mean, some of these teams are... Teams that have been favored and has been getting, you know, all kinds of privileges, you know, just based in their popularity and these national teams that they want to see because of, you know, TV ratings and the whole show. And those teams, they, they bitch more than anybody else, right? You know? And so that's the players. But the fans, and it's really, you know, easy to see in Boston because I, I can hear their Bostonian accent, right? Because I lived around that area. No people in that area. You know, the mass holes. You know, my nephew went to 
um, school play division like 1A or division two and like maybe a, I don't know what it was but he played in a um, played basketball for a team in Massachusetts and he was you know we were talking and he said the mass holes and then, <laughs> and then I, I moved to Massachusetts I you know been you know Connecticut and Massachusetts are very small states they're similar but the accent isn't there in Connecticut and you know I'd been to Massachusetts so many times but eventually lived there and worked there and I understood what he meant by mass holes right and so you see in some of these cities these northern cities where they're more aggressive and there's like people pulling their hair out like I you know I could go back and pull some clips I mean there are expressions really you know a lot of ugly people in Massachusetts at least in the Boston Garden and their big ghoul holes open they're screaming at the officials you can see them mouthing the words come on ref and you know Fans have gotten more abusive with opposing players and the officials. Now, the officials represent authority, right? They're the arbiters of authority, right? They administer the authority of the powers that be that run the league, right? In this case, you know, very much like, you know, you could say the police or whatever it is. And when they miss a call, are they booing because the referees are incompetent at doing their job, which would be, you know, rude because it's a hard job, right? That, you know, the referees aren't doing what they want them to do. or They feel they're entitled to, to the referees making their team win, right? You know, and referees are always going to be in the NBA more biased towards the home team. Because it's just, you know, it's good when home teams win to keep the fans coming, right? The winning percentage is always better for the home team. It's, you know, it's never been a you know a year where the away the visiting team won more games than the home teams right and so these fans are either booing the incompetence which you know there's no really no evidence to support that so there's this idea that their team is somehow screwed by life or they're screwed by life i mean their team represents their pathetic life where all the powers of be all the powers that be are against them but these are fans usually who are in the front rows of the seating and they, you know, which are very expensive, right? So these are people who are usually very rich. Some of them are famous, wealthy people. And there's this general sense that there's some sort of conspiracy against their team and them personally, and the system's rigged against them, right? <laughs> like every team, like every team, you see this, every group of fans come in with an attitude, like all those refs again, right? They're out to get our team and me personally because the world sucks and my life is a wreck and I don't know and it's unfair you know like there's no sense that okay the officials might make some mistakes and very seldomly does a, a bad call at least you can see it determine the outcome of a game or what I should say is a collective a collection of bad calls right that determine the where the officiating sucked throughout the game in a very one-sided manner now, there's these two famous games with um, the Los Angeles Lakers, Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant Lakers, where playoff games against the Portland Trailblazers and the Sacramento Kings appear to be blatantly rigged because the, the teams were up like 20 points, right, against the Lakers. And the Lakers had this epic comeback, which involved lots of one-sided officiating. So once in a while, you see that, where... There is definitely a, you know, the, offic the officials have to go outside of their, like, per diem or whatever you'd call it, and make a lot of bad calls to make the other team win, right? Like, it's a rigged situation. And, you know, that to me is a legitimate complaint by the fans and the players. At the end of a game, you can get, you know, they can always call fouls or they can throw the penalty flag in football, right? You can, you can call a foul on every play in the NBA. It's just interpretation. Like, you see, they let things go all the time. And so calling fouls is, you know, I mean, they have the replay now. It's a little bit harder to just make blatantly bad calls. But you can ignore things and or make a call when you, when you need to at the end of the game to tip the scales because, you know, they can keep the games close that way. And so you don't need a lot of poor officiating to rig a, a game, right? 
But what you see is as soon as the team starts losing, particularly, but they can be winning by a lot of points and still be, you know, see see the the players complain. But the fans, if they're winning, they don't they don't bitch about the refs. But when they're losing, they immediately assume that there's some conspiracy against themselves and their team, and that life is cheating them. I mean, this is you know a, a microcosm of Americans. Every demographic has this victim consciousness. You listen to anybody who identifies with some sort of demographic, you know, whatever it is, racially or sexually or whatever might, you know, whatever various demographics there are, young people, old people. I mean, it's just, you know, across all these different groups that people find themselves. And they'll tell you how their group is getting screwed, right? (laughs) You know, in a country where there's all this opulence and privilege and, you know, lifestyle, just keeps on getting better, all the technological developments. But every group is somehow screwed, right? Everybody who, you know, individually they're screwed and then as a group. You know, there's no faith in God or there's no sense of a plan or, you know, that bad things happen to people just every day. There's just this overwhelming victim consciousness. And you see it in these sporting events where they just, you know, blatantly troll. And the trolling has gotten so much worse, you know, now. They troll the, I mean, even to the extent of the opposing players, but the officials, the authority figures, like the authority figures are out to screw you and everything is cheated and you're getting cheated, whatever it might be, right? Nobody wins cleanly. If you lose, then the other team cheated or the the system was rigged in their favor, right? I mean, in, in life in general, anytime somebody loses, they've been cheated, right? They're a victim of something. Things go their way, of course, you know. Of course, I should I should win every time, so you know there should be no losers. Everyone gets a trophy, right? Like that's how Americans have grown up now, and so like it's the, I mean it's it's so flagrant how whiny and entitled, and you know conspiratorial people are. I mean this idea of conspiracy theorists, but pretty much everybody in every group thinks that there's some conspiracy to hold them back, and to screw them over. All right, with that in mind, let's um, get to the. So speaking of um, rigged, Amber Heard is not a very liked person. Um, I've talked about this before. Johnny Depp is, you know, horrible. Um, but Amber Heard is much more unlikable and maybe even more horrible. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't matter, right? You're, you're picking t- between two devils. And so it says, Celebrity takes side in Johnny Depp, Amber Heard trial. And so Johnny Depp has some celebrities on his side. Uh, Chris Rock, uh, Ireland Baldwin. It said here, um, let me see where the Ireland Baldwin thing is. The thing is, I know women who are exactly like this. They are manipulative, cold, and they use their very womanhood to play victim and turn the world against the man because... We live in a society where it's cool to say men, all the worst, blah, 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 effing, blah, blah. Um, Joe Rogan, you know, I know women like that too. (laughs) I've had experience with that. Uh, Bill Burr, they're all on Johnny Depp's side. Jennifer Aniston. And then supporting Amber Heard is Howard Stern, right? (laughs) who you really can't call a celebrity. I mean, he's Howard Stern and Helen Barkin, who's really ghouling it up, by the way. <laughs> so these are the only two people for Amber Heard, Ellen Barkin and Howard Stern. I mean, so it's, um, you know, somehow Amber Heard is the villain here. And, you know, Johnny Depp is a longtime uh, a devil worshiper, at least a, a devil worshiper adjacent because of his friend. I've talked about this in another video. But that's just how Amber Heard, how unlikable Amber Heard is. Machine Gun Kelly rocks 30K diamond manicure at Billboard Music Awards. So he's got diamonds on his fingers. Um, this is his manicure. Remember, he's got a teardrop because he killed a dude. He, speaking of Johnny Depp, he seems to be dressed up like Edward Scissorhands here. He's got the pink hair. 
And he's selling uh, nail polish. He's got his own nail polish merch line. And then down here is his uh, another picture of him again, like Edward Scissor's hands. Here he is with his dude. You know? <laughs> and, you know, he's got those spikes and looks like a real tough guy. He looks like he's dressed up as a, a matador. Um, but, you know, not a real one, right? <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres preps for her TV, TV farewell. She's been crying a lot. Ellen's been crying a lot, a source told Page Six. The whole few weeks leading up to the fi finale were very emotional. At Warner Brothers Studio in Burbank, California, that was she's called home for the last 20 years, she has filmed her final episode, and she's really upset about it because everyone figured out that she's not a nice person. And she got canceled, but it just took a long time for it to take effect. You know who else is a big fan of uh, Ellen? He looks appears to be speaking here. I'll maybe cover that tomorrow. But he has something here on Ellen. And it says, I cannot lie. <laughs> well, Alec, <laughs> you, lie for a, you're, 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 you lie for a living. You're a pretender. You're a faker. Actors are, you know, perpetual liars. This woman is one of the most talented and funniest people I've ever seen. Blessed with the gift of timing and observation. Oh, she's brilliant comedian. TV will be less without her. Onward. Some days I'm really good and some days I'm an emotional mess. I just was looking out. Mary brought her two daughters here to work. Mary did not have children. We started this show you did not Mary look at Mary Mary's got a Kleenex it's just so sad over there at Ellen now Marion has, has two daughters and you know when she started there didn't I mean that's how long this scrappy show's been on TV have any children I did all. not and now you have two two masked up daughters here <laughs> Mary what's going on human beings sitting right there <laughs> it's crazy Andy's daughter is here hi Aaron say hi Aaron Andy's daughter. Come on, don't be ashamed of that. Come on, Aaron. Uh -huh. She's not ashamed of her dad. Own up to it. That's your dad right there. You know it. <laughs> Never, ever thought it would last 19 years. Never thought we would get to do all the things. I mean, she's really gremlin it out, right? Just this. I mean, how much more gremlinly, she, gremlinly can she get? Things that we've done and helped so many people. And it really just started out kind of a springboard from doing stand-up because I love making people happy. I love making people laugh. It Except for your staff and crew and your people you're in relationship with and you know, everybody who knows you. You made them pretty miserable, right? <laughs> Torturing them and, you know, abusing them. And even some of your guests and fans. It's been something that I don't know what I'm going to do next, but this has been the best chapter of my life so far. It's been amazing. Yeah, you're going to go away and no one's going to remember you because, you know, that's what happened to people who interview other people, right? You don't have a second act. I mean, you're not a good stand-up comic. And people kind of, you know, most people other than your diehard fans kind of hate you now and realize you're not the be kind lady that you pretended to be. You're like the, you know, be evil lady, the gatekeeper like Jimmy Kimmel's. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> That's Ellen. The stock market's best hope this year is for the companies to return some of their seven point one trillion cash pile to investors, Bank of America says. <laughs> well, then there's no hope because that ain't happening. <laughs> These companies aren't gonna give up their, you know, their cash flow to their investors. So my wife sent this to me, I think, uh, last night, day before. This is Kamala. That is especially true when it comes to the climate crisis, which is why we will work together and continue to work together to address these issues, to tackle these challenges, and to work together. They work together. There's a theme here. She said it three times already now. As we continue to work operating from the new norms, rules, and agreements that we will convene to work together on. 
<laughs> you see a theme. To galvanize global action. With that, I thank you all. This is a matter of urgent priority for all of us. And I know we will work on this together. Okay, so we're definitely working on this together. She has a very weird cadence in her voice. She doesn't talk like a serious person, but she's not funny either, right? Almost like, you know, she's going to cackle at you, but she does that weird cackle. But she's not very convincing. And they're stuck with her because Jojo Magoo, you know, I don't know whether he, he nominated her because she, this team, not him, but this team knew how bad she was. And that would give Jojo Magoo some security because they wouldn't, you know, come after him for being, you know, senile <laughs> because they're handling him. If the people didn't like Kamala, which they don't. Like she polled, I mean, I saw this in the debate. She was the least likable person on a stage for people who were very unlikable. And now they're stuck with her and she's as bad a public speaker. I mean, Jojo Magoo's had his whole, whole career and, you know, me mental depreciation to account for him being a bad speaker, right? Like he's worked on it his whole life and he's gotten worse. And she just sucks at it. She's not, you know... She's not presidential, and she has many of the same problems that he has, and she's not even got dementia. Um, lots of gas, and just, like, she gets lost out there. I want to show that I'm going to do a compilation of her saying, um, and then there's, I think I have another compilation of her saying something over and over again in a speech. I'll see if I can find that in a couple of memes. Um, but that's Kamala working together which is why we will work together and continue to work together and to work together, to work together on, and I know we will work on this together. But we're not going back. We are not going back. Which party and which party, which party and which party, anyone in our country may face a future where the government can interfere with their personal decisions. Well, we say, how dare they? So this is um, Jojo Magoo honoring the 40th Annual National Peace Officers Memorial Service. But you're going to see here that this guy is going to introduce him. This must be from last year. And there's two different versions of this. I watched a little bit on the news, and I couldn't believe how bad JoJo was speaking. So that's why I think they're covering this up. But they've posted a video, and it says it was posted uh, like 19 hours ago. But this appears to be last year's. This is on, this is on NBC News. Mr. Joseph R. Biden. Notice the shaky camera. I'm Jill Biden's husband. We've heard that before. <laughs> Let me play the compilation for you. I'm Jill Biden's husband. My name is Joe Biden. I'm Barack Obama's <laughs> vice president. And I'm Jill Biden's husband. My name is Joe Biden. I'm Jill Biden's husband. My name is Joe Biden. I'm Bill Biden's husband. You know, like a granddad joke. It's not even a dad joke. It's a granddad joke. And, well, let me show you this. He stole it, right? He plagiarized it from JFK, so it isn't even his original joke. I do not uh, think it altogether inappropriate to introduce myself to this audience. I am the man who accompanied... Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. I am Jill's husband. <laughs> Hello. As I said many times before, I'm Jill's husband. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Jill Biden's husband. <clears throat> My name's Joe Biden. Please sit down. I'm Jill's husband and Naomi Biden's grandfather. My name is Joe Biden. I am Jill Biden's husband. That's why I'm better known. President Yost. 
So this is from last year, like I said. That joke doesn't work, I've talked about before. One, he's trying to... I mean, it's mocking his his status over Jill's status, right? That's the only thing that would be funny about it. It doesn't work. It's not funny. The first time, you know. Um, Auxiliary present. Any? So this is the... Um, the side boob, <laughs> the side boob version of it, right, from Washington Post. As they do, we must all work together to address the hate that remains a stain on the soul of America. So this is a side version. They start and, you know, he's already begun here. When you find Joe Biden's speeches, oftentimes they're partial speeches. They, uh, they don't start at the beginning where he's introduced, like in this case, and they don't run the full speech or they, they, they edit it or they edit things out. I mean, they're, they're, very, they're not always going to show you everything that Joe Jobago says because he's a disaster. This is the MSM, this is the NBC, other NBC one. Um, it's, this one starts, you see how blurry it is? I mean, the age of digital cameras. So they have one camera that's uh, shaky and it's, you know, it's hard to watch. It's, it takes you away from what you're seeing. The audio echoes in that one. And then this one, it's all blurry. Barry Mayorkas and the director of the FBI and Secret Service, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, U.S. Marshal Service, U.S. Capitol Police, all for being here but for your leadership. So the reason I'm showing you this is there's only one of these versions that's the full version that has digital camera and good audio and no shaky footage, right? Of all the, I had to search for it because it was on whitehouse.gov and it didn't come up when I searched for this speech. And so they've literally hid this guy away. And when you see the speech, you'll know why. But the problem is, you know, I used to collect Jojo Magoo gaffes when he was running for office. And I had a, like a seven minute compilation. But now there's, in every speech, there's three, four, five gaffes. And we've gotten used to them. Like we just, you know, <laughs> like we just, all right, this is what the guy does. I mean, he's drooling on himself. I mean, like he's just a, you know, a mess, right? And yet there's so many of them that you can't, you can't even bother. I couldn't even bother collecting them all. I would have to, you know, do all kinds of extra effort to clip them and put them together and then find them you know, in search, and there'd be so many of them, I'd never be able to get to them. And, you know, other than putting together in one massive compilation, which would be interesting, we already know he does this. I mean, the people on the right, Republicans, are aware of this, and people in the truth community, but everybody else is just dismissive of it, dismissive of it especially the media. You know, and it's become pointless. Like, he's gaffed himself into normalcy where it's just accepted, there's nothing anybody to do about it. And so he can gaff it up all he wants. But even in that, they're trying to hide away some of his more, uh, you know, horrible speeches. Join me in welcoming president, the President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden. <laughs> Woo! Just a smattering of applause, right? President Yost, Auxiliary President Haney, Auxiliary President Lehman, and uh, Director and good friend Jimmy Pasco. We've worked together a long time. Him and Jimmy Pasco, they've worked together for years. I mean, he's just, he's not there. He's gone. Like, he doesn't, you know, he sounds like somebody who's, like, on some sort of drugs, right? To somebody who's disassociating and not there and present. This, is, this one he doesn't do that Jill Biden's. I'm Jill's husband, Joe, right? That's last year. Thank you for inviting me to join you today uh, and for the service you've extended to this nation. I'd also like to thank the Attorney General, Attorney General Garland, Attorney General Gupta, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas, and the Director of the FBI and Secret Service, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, U.S. Marshal Service, U.S. Capitol Police, all for being here but for your leadership. We're also uh, jo He's just like, like, it's JoJo in Wonderland, like he's on some sort of hallucinogenic or something, right? Joined by my longtime friends, Senator Patrick Leahy and House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. So let's skip ahead here. 
when they got the call. They're pulled in those as if you got pulled in a black hole in your chest. There's no way out. A black hole in your chest where your heart used to be. <laughs> Back when you had a heart tin man, right? It's JoJo and uh, the Wizard of Oz now. Jill and I know. We know no memorial, no gestures can fill the void in the hearts they have now or that you, you who've lost someone feel as well. Being here today and hearing the name of your husband, wife, father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister brings it all back. So let's do it again. Let's re-traumatize the <laughs> families. As if you got that phone call 10 minutes ago. The American people, we owe you. You know, you sit down in the street, your normal families. Sit down in the street? What is he talking about? All neighbors. And every day, you worry. And you worry you'd get that phone call as they pinned on that shield. This is so bad, right? So these are people who lost um, law enforcement, uh, law enforcement people who died in 2021, and they have this memorial, and some of them show up here to listen to this guy babble like an incoherent, drug-induced idiot. And now you look at an empty chair. Although I didn't personally know your husband's wives, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, I knew them. They were the first ones to run into help when everyone else ran away when we were kids. <laughs> like me, I was running away, and there's other guys running to help. And I'm like, hey, you're going to be a cop, and I'm going to be pressing. <laughs> when we were young men and women, even in grade school, they jump in when someone else was threatened or being bullied, regardless of the odds. Regardless of the odds. Well, it, was pan it was corn pop, and the guy had a chain, and I had a chain. Corn pop had a straight razor. And I'm like, guys, come and jump in, because, you know, I'm going to be president someday. Think about it. It was part of their DNA. They didn't think about it in terms of serving, protecting, and defending, but that's what they did. They served even before they put on that shield. They protect it, and they were there. Being a police officer is not just what they did. It's who they were. Who they were. It's not what they did. Who they were. Like, I'm not just a babbling idiot when I'm a president. It's who I am. I'm babbling. This is what I do. I was telling the president. Um, you're the president. <laughs> you're the president. What president were you telling? This organization. I grew up in a neighborhood where he became a cop, a firefighter, or a priest. Or president, if you're really stupid. I wasn't qualified for any of them, so here I am. But all kidding aside. <laughs> okay. You know, is there should be jokes, Jojo Magoo, when you're dealing with grieving loved ones who are being honored, right? We expect so much from our law enforcement officers today. This is a different world we're in. Just in the last several years, it's so much more complicated. The job is complicated. Yet we expect so much more of all of you. We in this complicated world that we created. We expect you to be drug counselors for the 100,000 overdose deaths that took place this year. 100,000 overdose deaths. Wow, that's um, pretty close to the amount of COVID deaths. 100,000. We expect you to counsel those who speak to a couple in the midst of a violent confrontation, a husband and wife, man and woman. So many of you. Do they have to be men and women? What kind of, uh, you know, what regressive position is that? are literally and figuratively get caught in a crossfire. 
literally and figur- figuratively, figuratively, literally, figuratively cross the crossfire. This way, let's look at. He's just a mess, this guy. Or literally and figuratively get caught in a cross. Figuratively. <laughs> it's literally and figuratively. Crossfire. You're not trained psychologist. You're law enforcement officers. But you should be doing counseling anyway. Just go ahead and wing it. Like, I'm, I'm the president. I don't, know situation. I don't know what the F I'm doing. I don't have any qualifications. And I'm just wing it. Just do it what I do. Go with that massive empty hole and black hole in your in your chest where your heart used to be. Just use that to navigate through your, your decision-making process as you're counseling people in crisis. We expect you to be everything. We expect everything of you. Being a cop today is a heck of a lot harder than it's ever been. <laughs> COVID-19, one million deaths in America. A million deaths in America in three years. Leaving behind, the estimates indicate, nine significant family members or other. We'll also look at that empty chair at the kitchen table. So many kids left behind because of COVID, schools closing down. Okay, this is about cops, though, right? You're engaged in longer shifts. The strain and stress of it all is why I continue to be so committed to do more, do better, to keep you safe, to keep our community safe, and to build trust and respect that everyone deserves, particularly all of you. We should focus on and fund the things we know that work, like crime prevention and community policing. Not one cop in a car, but two walking the street. Not one cop sitting cozy in a car. I'm going to help you guys out. I'm going to put two of you guys on the street, take away your car, and we'll have you guys walk the beat in suburbs, walk the cul-de-sacs in suburbs. <laughs> with no cards, walk around. If you know, you run if you have to, like if it's 10 miles away and you get a call. Cops who walk the beat, who know the neighborhood, who can restore trust and safety. Folks, the answer is not to abandon the streets. It's not to choose. Be- Wait, who's, who's, who's saying it's, who's saying we should abandon the streets? What politician or anybody else is saying it's time to abandon the streets, right? It's time the police abandon the streets. <laughs> it's like, is somebody pitching this idea of um, the purge? Is, is like, <laughs> were you watching the purge movie before? <laughs> this idea is that we abandon the streets to let, every, let anything go. I was watching it on, on, a, on the TV. It was the news. I was like, hey, what are they doing out there? Well, that was the purge, Mr. President. Well, the what? The pur- The what? Between safety and equal justice and we should agree it's not to defund the police it's to fund the police <laughs> say it again fund them it's Would fund you- them we're not trying to fund you even though my party and all these liberal democrats were saying let's get rid of the police altogether in some cities how'd that go over right in minneapolis and these other places not to to fund the police we're going to fund you guys Guess what? I got a revolutionary idea. We're not going to defund you. We're going to fund you. Like we're going to give you money and pay jobs and give you equipment and stuff and training. The resources, the training, they need to protect our communities and themselves and restore trust among the police and the people. My dad used to say. What do you say, Jojo? Jojo, you never amount to anything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stick that thing <laughs> in the wall socket. <laughs> what, what did he say? Those are my guesses. When someone would say, let me tell you what I value, Joe. He looked at me and say, Don't tell me what you my dad was a a well read high school educated man who was a graceful man. He said, Don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget. And I will tell you what you value. Military. It's, that's the military then, Joe. That's war. 
That's what you just admitted to. That most of the money goes to war and then lining, you know, the rich people's pockets. Well, here's what I value. As soon as I came to office, we inherited a raging pandemic with only two million people vaccinated. We needed to rebuild our economy. Okay, this is about the police, which and hasn't happened, right? Restore public safety. We understood the risks the communities could face with rising violence during the pandemic and at a time when state and local budgets were shrinking because they didn't have the tax base. They're having to lay off cops, firefighters, teachers. They were under tremendous strain. So we made sure we passed a thing called the American Rescue Plan, providing historic $350 billion directly to the cities and counties and states and tribes. Yes, there you go. The tribes got some money for the police and the teachers. And it was money that we just printed because we're broke as F, right? <laughs> we just made some money up and they just added it to the debt and we threw it out there to you guys. You're welcome. So they didn't have to lay off law enforcement. They could keep the cops on the job and fight to keep communities safe. And it's working. More than 300 communities from big cities to small towns are using more than $10 billion. The American Rescue Plan funds for violence prevention and public safety this year. Building new police training facilities. Recruit. Why are you screaming now, JoJo? Like he was in a daze before. Thank you, Mr. Thou, and the buying and that thing. And then he's like screaming at you. Hey, no, I'm Joe Sargent. My mother said, if everything bad, something good will come if you look hard enough for it. <laughs> Well, you know, that's misery's divine blessings and heartfulness. Let's see how your mom's um, idea compares with this misery's as divine blessings. And the idea in heartfulness is miseries that happen in the material life are blessings for you in your spiritual life and also to build character because it clears away impressions. It keeps you humble and, and it helps you move along in your spiritual path and get closer to God. And so let's go back here. Let's listen to that again. His mom had similar sentiment, and he, she said this. Before it's too late, my mother said, if everything bad, something good will come if you look hard enough for it. We're looking hard to determine why and what we can do to prevent that law enforcement officer being put in the middle. Okay, this doesn't sound like something you're looking hard. But you're not seeing. I'm encouraging every mayor, governor, to use the American resource money they have, and they have it now. You spend it now. Spend it now. Don't save it. Don't store it away for when the economic collapse hit and the value is worth nothing. Don't wait until the dollar is worth nothing. This summer, when crime historically spikes, and this rescue funding for police is part of a comprehensive strategy to combat violence in America. I've laid out this plan to all the police agencies, and they're taking a look, good look at it. They're taking a good look at it. They're like, well, why is it in crayon? <laughs> why, why, did it, why do you write it in crayon? With my budget last year, we increased funding for state and local law enforcement by almost, well, not almost, 29%. That included significant investments in community already in police services. The cop you know, the guy just isn't there. I mean, he gets worse and worse. It's like his whole speech. There's nothing here that's, I mean, there's some statements and things, and I don't know if he's reading. He's got his ghoul hole open here, right? And it's just, you know, he's gone. Cop program designed to build legitimacy and trust in communities, to address violent crime, to combat hate and extremism. My budget for the next year doubles the investment in community policing. $573 million, the most in over a decade. And on top of that, it includes $30 billion in new mandatory investments in law enforcement. All right, so um, we can't go through the rest of this. But, uh, you know, they're, like, covering up for this guy, right? I mean, they have been for a while, but this is 
the only clear version where you can see them and it's clear audio everything else is blurry are they putting it up for the wrong year you know they're just and this is only getting 5,000 views nobody comes to this channel and so um you know they just don't want you to see how bad he's deteriorating so a few more things here i got a funny comment i want to get to maybe two i'm not sure but there was um somebody who asked me if i was going to cover was waiting for me to cover how both those basketball game sevens which i talked about at the beginning of this video the boston celtics versus the milwaukee bucks and the phoenix suns versus the dallas Mavericks were fixed you know um I've said before that it's entertainment, right? Like wrestling is, but they have to play some sort of game and there has to be some sort of competition. They can't fix everything because, you know, people are betting on it, whatever it might be, right? And so I don't think they can involve the players in fixing games because the players are young and emotional. And if you had, you know, all these basketball players who had been a part of fixing games, one of them would eventually talk, right? I mean, inevitably it would come out. The best way to fix it is the refs, because usually a game can be decided by just a few calls here and there. And a few, uh, you know, well-placed calls to put some star in foul trouble or whatever it is, right? And so um, those games, the players were, uh, the players on the two losing teams were either missing on purpose or they were just sucking. The Phoenix Suns completely collapsed. But anyways, you know, there's no way to really tell, right? Only when there's huge disparities in the, the way the games are officiated. I talked about those Los Angeles Lakers games, playoffs games against the Kings and the Trailblazers. You can look those up. And there was like 20 fouls called on the other teams and, and like two called on the Lakers in, a, in like a third or fourth quarter. You know, where the Lakers had these epic comebacks that seemed completely improbable. Um, but anyways, and so let me get to some of these comments here. I'm going to find them. Um, the first one, this person says, you get so fake outraged over Kate McKinnon's jokes about abortion, even a baby at a fire station. You said that's not something to joke about. Then you mock that woman's testifying before Congress after her cousin's pregnancy. Oh, you cracked the code. You got me. <laughs> the person's, you know, random capital letters in the, in the comment. Um, like there's, um, there's, it starts off with Y O and then U small. Um, but anyways, that's not, you know, like, I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I was mocking the woman who was telling the story, right? like her cousin, like some congresswoman. But, you know, I mean, whatever. <laughs> like, people think they're going to get you, like some kind of, you know. I call you being a hypocrite, okay. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so, you know, like, I, you know. Oh, I am? I mean, I cover people who, and again, I'm not, you know, operating on a, a bell curve or some sort of comparison here. I have my own, you know, morality and my own spiritual you know, my own spiritual progress to answer for. I don't compare myself to the depraved people I cover. But if the person used any sort of, you know, they had any sort of critical thinking skills, what I was doing was mocking the woman who was talking about her cousin getting an abortion that was posted by Alec Baldwin. If you saw that video, it was on my other channel, uh, Apocalypse Now channel. But uh, what Kate McKinnon was doing was she was making fun of leaving babies at the fire station and or, you know, just dropping them on the street and just, you know, I don't care. Like, I'm not outraged by it. I'm not offended by it. I'm saying you can't really do that. You can't make fun of abortion in that way because it's not funny. The jokes weren't funny on their own, but it's a, like touchy subject, right? And so this is a mainstream comedian. I mock things all the time. I don't care if people like it or not. Or, you know, they say, oh, that's you know, shame on you. Or, you know, how dare you? Like, you know, I make fun of people who say shame on you and how dare you. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not offended by things or other people's beliefs. I just, I've seen so much and it's just such a crap show. What difference does it make, right? 
I mean, as far as I'm concerned, go ahead, make fun of all these things as much as you want. It gives me material to cover. Just like leave as many stupid comments as you can. <laughs> you know, because it just gives me something that I can mock. And this person says, um, well, this is a two commenter. So one person wrote, Alex Jones is definitely a shill, but Brain Force Plus is also good stuff. I'm not sure what that is. Must be one of his um, things he bitches. But then another person says, Ghoul Romano, <laughs> that's me, is the shill of all shills if we were being honest with a smiley face. Well, you're not being honest to yourself or any of us, right? Calling me Ghoul Romano, like this is, you know, I've repopulized the word ghoul. So that means you, you listen to me all the time and you are copying me, right? <laughs> I set a trend and you are using that trend to get me like, you know, I'm going to be offended, which I'm not. But the difference here is Alec, uh, Alex Jones made a reportedly, he grossed reportedly three in three years, 160, 151 million dollars, right? And I'm not making a fraction of that, right? I'm not making $1 million in three years, right? <laughs> And so, what am I shilling for? Like, who's the bigger shill? Alex has um, more viewers and makes more money. So he would be the bigger shill. If I was shilling and he was shilling, he would be the bigger shill, right? Like, because he's making a lot more money and he has a lot more viewers, a lot more reach, a lot more people know who he is. And so he would be the bigger shill. You know, it's basic math, <laughs> But if you can't figure out that Alex Jones is a shill, another person wrote how they loved my videos or something, but Alex Jones has woken someone with people up. He's done such great work, and I'm wrong about it. I'm like, how can you not see it? Like, it's just so obvious now, right? It was obvious um, for me back in uh, whenever he did that interview with Piers Morgan, probably back in 2000, uh, you know, 10 or something, 2011, something like that, 2012. And he was just a, a like a buffoon, just a complete idiot on that interview, embarrassing himself, embarrassing the truth community. And they did an interview with uh, NBC News, and his show changed, and he changed the format of his show, made it more like mainstream news. He fired a lot of people who were you know, more independent, and he stopped having quality guests. And then he went full... Um, in 2014 or whatever, 15, he went full in for Trump and went full right wing before he used to know about the left right paradigm. Right. And so like, I, you know, I didn't watch him over those years, but he was just showing up and doing things that were hurting the rest of us. And his positions became more and more of like, you know, and, and shilling in the sense that he now had a big budget, he had a big nut you know, with all the studio money, all this equipment, all these employees. And so he needed to, I mean, he literally shills snake oil, you know, <laughs> to his viewers. And if you buy it, you buy it, right? And, you know, I mean, <laughs> what can you say? Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramato, definitely reporting from the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.